Good day. My name is Randy Armstrong, and I'm the chair of the OPC UA Security Working Group. Today, I want to talk to you about OPC UA over MQTT. Specifically, I want to talk to you about topic trees, metadata, and the link to the OPC UA cloud library. Now, it's worth uh, talking a bit about OPC UA over MQTT and its relationship to OPC UA client server and uh, the PubSub technology. Now, PubSub itself is a generic mechanism that will work over any middleware, um, including UDP, including any type of broker-based uh, uh, communication. OPC uh, PubSub um, over MQTT is a mapping that incorporates uh, MQTT features into UA PubSub. So allow um, users of that mapping to take advantage of some of the unique capabilities of MQTT which uh, we'll be talking about later in this discussion. Um, now, the important thing to remember about UA PubSub is it's, it's an extension to uh, client server. It doesn't replace uh, client server. In fact, in any system, uh, you're going to have tasks that need to be done that are best handled with request response. Uh, tasks such as browsing the server address space, where you're where you're navigating down a tree and following, and following um, uh, references to di between different nodes. That is really done well with um, uh, client server. Uh, but in other cases, if you just want to push uh, a large volume of data up to the cloud, a broker is a very very is a very good solution. So any real system is going to have a combination of client server and pub sub. And OPC UA is the only technology that allows you to seamlessly integrate and switch between those two modes of communication. So that sort of touches on one of the bigger reasons why OPC UA, you'd want to use OPC UA with MQTT. But in sort of a general higher level view, it supports for multiple protocols. It supports binary and JSON encodings. Binary, if you want to have a much more compact, um, efficient format. It supports end-to-end -end security with the binary. It also has a standard configuration information model and file format. This is much more important than people realize. A lot of systems with, uh, that are built with MQTT today uh, involve putting a lot of custom code on a bunch of different devices to push uh, messages that were designed based on what the subscribers needed in that particular system. These, um, this code, uh, is, so after this code is done, the system basically works, but you end up with maybe hundreds of devices that all have to be manually configured. This is going to be very difficult. These kinds of systems are going to be very difficult to maintain in the long run. OPC UA offers a solution to that. With a standard PubSub configuration information model, as well as a way to represent the configuration in a compact file that can be uploaded or downloaded from machines. The information model combined with an OPC UA server running on devices allows uh, the configuration of every publisher and subscriber to be, rem be remotely managed by, uh, by tools developed for the task. Um, and most importantly, you can have a tool developed by one vendor be able to configure a publisher created by another vendor. The other big feature of OPC UA with MQTT is integration with OPC UA information models. And these information models are a big part of OPC UA because they allow um, servers, uh, basically sources of data, to express their information with rich semantic context. And this context is, is in part from comes from the base OPC UA specification, but also from the many, many companion specs for different verticals, from robots to PLCs to kitchen equipment to pumps and many more. All of these different verticals have created standard information models. So you can have a robot by one vendor will look will have the will look just like a robot from another vendor. And this gives a new level of interoperability to uh, between applications that we never had before. And you get that integration with OPC UA over MQTT. 
And this is particularly important because there's no need to take the information models. And, and a, lot of, a lot of times people sort of assume you take this information out of the information models, put it into some intermediate format, and you lose all this information when it's sent over the broker. You don't need to do that anymore. Now, the OPC UA over MQTT mapping includes a recommended set of topic trees. Now, it's recommended because a lot of MQTT installations have a factory specific topic tree set up. The vendor or the factory owner has basically decided they want to have uh, all of their data presented in a certain way because it's, it suits their, the processes that they need to run. And OPC UA PubSub allows the publishers to be configured to be published to any sort of, of topic tree. And so they can integrate nicely in with these factory specific topic trees. However, if you don't have those kinds of trees in place, or they didn't, didn't necessarily require, there's a recommended way to structure your topics, so based on the publisher configuration. So this gives a certain amount of predictability, so you know exactly where to go looking for your data if you understand the, the uh, uh, OPC UA PubSub configuration model. And in addition, the PubSub configuration model, uh, sorry, the PubSub, um, sorry, the MQTT topic tree, the recommended topic tree, um, provides all the metadata that you need to completely understand the data. And so you can have hybrid installations where you put all your metadata into the recommended tree while you're sending your data to the factory specific tree. And the subscribers can link the two together and uh, and be able to better understand the context and the semantics of the data that they're receiving. Now the recommended MQTT topic tree uh, has a has a format that follows generally well understood conventions when it comes to MQTT topics. You have a prefix defining the the scope of the of the identifiers, an encoding, and then a message type. Then after that, you've got a hierarchy that's based on the pub sub configuration. The bottom of the, the top of the hierarchy is the publisher ID. The publisher can represent a device, but it doesn't have to. You can have a device can have many publishers. In some cases, you can have um, redundant devices that are publishing to the same publisher ID. These are all decisions that are made by the um, by the system architect. The group names themselves, um, you can, it's up to the system architect to determine what sensible groups to, that may, what groups make sense for the given, the, given the data or events that they're publishing. And the data set writers represent uh, messages that are put on the wire. So each, each uh, data set writer has a different set of fields that are, that are bundled into a message and published to the broker. Now, one of the things that people need to be able to do with the topic tree, and this is, this is one of the things that makes MQTT so popular, is the ability, the ability to use wildcards in their subscriptions in order to um, be able to effectively discover what's out there on the broker. So, for example, if you want to find all the publishers that are available on the broker, you would subscribe to the status topic. And the status topic um, would uh, is connected to the last will and testament, and would report whenever a publisher goes offline. But it also reports other uh, status information related to the publisher. So if the publisher is running fine, but the downstream source of data is gone, this information will be, be reported to the status. So this has got a very simple way for you to find out everything in your system everything out there that's in your system. If you wanted to then find the exact messages that are being published to the broker, you would subscribe to the metadata. And this would give you a description of basically the schema for every message that's published. And you can then decide which ones you're interested in. If you want to limit your query to a particular publisher, you can then you can uh, include the publisher ID in the in the uh, in the topic wildcard, 
and that would allow you to select select all data from device one or all data from device two. And there's many other possibilities, obviously. So the message types can appear at two levels. So at the top level, the message type uh, uh, is on the publisher ID. You have the status, which is used to detect when publishers appear on the network. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's uh, connected to the MQTT last will and testament. The application and endpoint information tell you something about the source of the, uh, the application that's actually publishing the information, as well as the endpoints that could be used for client server. And this is, this is going to be very useful in, in some cases where the subscriber is getting data and they realize that they that they need to do something that can't really be done with pub sub and they need to switch over to client server well the information they need to be able to do that they can get from the broker from the endpoints topic now obviously this assumes that this particular subscriber has got some got the necessary permissions and network connectivity to connect to the server but that will that in some cases that will be true the connection, uh, uh, connection message type gives you all the, the metadata for all the data set writers that are published for a particular pub sub, uh, for a particular publisher. So you can, you can uh, get all that data and then, and then allow you to, um, allow you to uh, in a batch mode, sort of set up your, um, set up your subscriber as opposed to subscribing to, subscribing to individual topics. Uh, and the last one is the node set. This is the node set fragment. And I'll be talking more uh, a bit about what the word fragment means, but it provides basic information model context information. And this is the first part of the links that we're adding between the information models and the data as, uh, as part of our uh, MQTT mapping. So at the dataset writer name, writer level, we've got a few more a few more message types. You've got the data, which is where you're actually getting the live data, which uh, is, are basically messages that have name value pairs um, based on uh, based on whatever was configured configured for the publisher. The metadata provides the schema that des that describes the the data that's published. So it is the minimal amount of information. It's basically the names of the fields. So it, it says the, the, uh, the data message will have a field X and a field Y, and X is an, int 30, is an integer value, Y is a string, and uh, oh, by the way, Y has some engineering units, and, and this, is, this is what those engineering units are. So it's, it's basic information that is useful to a subscriber. Now, if you want the complete context of where this data is coming from, the source provides a mapping between all of the fields that are in the, in the data message and nodes in the node set that was published at the publisher level. And so this is, this is the sort of the first breadcrumb. So you get your data, you can get your metadata, and you go from your source and that allows you to go back to the node set and get the actual nodes. So the node set fragment, um, the reason we have to have a node set fragment is MQTT brokers have a maximum message size. And if you just throw all your nodes in there, that message limit is gonna be blown up. So there's a need for some logic in the publisher to create a subset and Typically, this will involve going up one level, going down one level, and that will give some reasonable context for in most cases. Uh, in other cases, in the publisher may want to add more information, but that judgment is left up to uh, whoever's doing the conf whoever's creating the configuration for the uh, for the publisher. So the important thing, though, is the, is the node set fragment leaves out all the types. The types are never included in the fragment, but the node IDs that reference the types are there. So these node IDs would be, will be links that we'll, that we'll use to go look, look up that information elsewhere, and I'll talk about how to do that in a bit. Now, 
the minimum information you have to have is of course um, the node that is the source for every for every field that's published in every data set so um, so that information is is uh, shows up at the so from the source uh, message type at the data level which I mentioned in the previous slide and that links back to the nodes that are in the node set fragment now you don't necessarily need to include some of the some of the uh, uh, properties such as uh, e range and and um, these kinds of things uh, in the node set fragment if you have included it in the metadata so the metadata has this ability to to include immediate properties of each each field if these properties change rarely so if if the and it's, it's good for stuff like uh, engineering units it's good for stuff, value precision and a few other things that are all defined by the specification so those nodes if you're putting them in the metadata don't need to be in the, in the in the fragment but it, you can believe them there as well either it's really it's really uh, it's it's a judgment um, by the configurer and uh, we will eventually develop a number of recommendations and guidelines for how people can put this together and preferably there will be uh, some sort of standard algorithm uh, simple algorithm to give you the basic set useful set so you've done that you've got your your note set fragment you're publishing to the broker the subscriber gets this information it follows the breadcrumbs it gets the metadata, gets the source, gets the node set, and it says, great, I've got this information, but it's not enough. How do I get the rest of the information? Well, there's a couple options. The first option is the subscriber is pre-configured with a number of companion spec node sets, or basically all the node sets that are that are uh, the system is known to be using in some sort of local cache. So it can use the, the namespace that's associated with the types that show up in the uh, in the node set fragment to find the uh, find the uh, complete definition of these types in their local cache. But there's another option, and that has to do with the UA Cloud, Cloud Library, which is another specification that has been re recently released and uh, it now has uh, and now has working uh, working uh, examples online. And this is a um, library that provides rest interfaces that stores um, information models like basically node sets uh, that can be uh, queried by clients um, using either simple queries with namespace uris or complex uh, graphql queries uh, it's a powerful um, standard but for purposes here all you really need to do is go take the note take the namespace and say give me the node set and you can download that now for static node sets particularly the ones that are defined by the companion specs um, uh, that works reasonably well but the cloud library also allows the publisher to upload its server specific node set so as part of its configuration and setup the publisher may have a number of different types that it's using it can then upload those types to the uh, upload a node set that defines those types to the cloud library, and then the subscriber can now get those get those types from the cloud library. So you have the subscriber can now reconstruct the address space from the uh, publisher that is being used to describe the fields that are in the messages via these node sets that it collects from the cloud library or its local cache it provides a complete context and semantics and this is going to be very very uh, a very powerful tool especially for uh, more complicated analytics engines that that need to understand the semantics of the data they're getting it's and it's uh, it's going to be a valuable tool especially when you have many different publishers using the same information models because they're they're basing their they're basing their uh, um, server address space on a standard companion spec and now you've got this integration between these disparate sources that may be coming from different different devices made by different vendors they're all producing the information that is all described in the same way it's a level of interoperability and, and semantic interoperability that, that uh, hasn't existed before. 
Another feature that is part of the uh, MQTT um, mapping is the ability to invoke methods via the broker. And recalling these things actions because they're not exactly the same as methods. But um, it has a similar, a similar uh, the topic names follow a similar pattern uh, in terms of how they're laid out. And um, so the action itself, the action group name can be, can, be an, can be represent the object that you're invoking the action on, and then the action name can represent the method name. Or it could be the reverse, the action group name could be the method, and then the action names could be a bunch of objects that you are, uh, that you are uh, uh, accessing, accessing the, uh, uh, doing the same action on, or calling the same method on. It's really up to the system architect to decide the appropriate, uh, the appropriate representation for each of these things. So what happens here is we're leveraging the uh, standard reply topic, which is part of uh, MQTT 5.0. It's uh, put in the header that basically says, this is where the response goes to. So you send the network message to the, to the, to the, pu to the publisher's uh, uh, action topic, and it gets this message. It, that processes the method, uh, processes the uh, method, and then returns the response back to the topic that was provided in the in the uh, in the request, and then the caller eventually gets a response. Obviously, this is a completely asynchronous operation because the broker itself is completely asynchronous. So um, the uh, there's going to be uh, certain classes of certain classes of methods which aren't going to be appropriate to model in this way, but it will be useful in enough cases uh, that, um, that it will be a powerful capability in a lot of systems. Now the message types for actions include the action request, which is a topic where things are being sent. And um, this, is, this is where you basically bundle up your request parameters and you send them, send them to the publisher. The action metadata is the metadata this, that describes the contents of the request message and the contents of the response, and plus some other some some other uh, metadata about the um, about the uh, method being invoked. And um, so this this basically metadata gives the this the subscriber the caller everything that they need to know in order to construct the message and understand the response. The action source is the breadcrumb that links you back to the information model. So basically, because all these actions map onto an object and method in the address space, these action source tells you what exact object and what method that the action is action is based on. And so they would link back to the back to the node set fragment, which in turn can be linked back to a, uh, a type model, which can be downloaded from the uh, UA cloud cloud library. Now, obviously, actions are privileged operations. You don't want to have anyone sending, changing the state of your publisher with with the invoking actions. So you need to know who's who's doing this. Now, um, in in many cases, there will be ability within the broker to restrict access to a particular topics. And you can use the broker to restrict access to these actions, but it's also useful for the for the actual publisher to know who's sending who's sending the um, uh, actions, so they can apply their own access control. And it's also could be important for logging. They need to indicate they need to know uh, who sent it, so they can log the action that took place. And to do this, they need to have some way to identify it. And this is where adding a non-repudiation signature onto the message is a simple way to provide this information. And when we're using JSON message formats, there is a well understood um, RFC that is used widely for um, interoperability between websites today called the JSON Web Token. And it can be adapted and used as the as the message payload for MQTT. So you basically take the network message that you normally would send out, put it into this envelope that's defined by the RFC, and provide a signature. The header would include the certificate and the chain, so the um, so the so the publisher would be able to use the certificate to determine the identity and the chain to determine 
access rights. So it's a very flexible mechanism that allows that allows uh, the publisher to restrict to be configured to restrict um, access to a class of uh, a class of uh, um, uh, subscribers. And and it tie it could potentially tie into its its existing uh, security configuration. So it would use the same security configuration that it uses for client server to determine access to the actions. So what are the next steps? Well, MQTT has been part of the uh, specification uh, since uh, 1.04. Uh, there are implementations that exist today. And we've been having uh, interoperability events on the web that have been ongoing as multiple vendors are testing their implementations with each other. Uh, the topic tree extension is, uh, is new. It's, for, it's going to be released with 1.0502. Um, the prototyping is in progress. And the RC uh, for the uh, specification that includes the topic tree discussion uh, is on track to be released by the end of uh, Q2 2022, and uh, that will give that will give vendors a chance to incorporate uh, some of these new features into into their implementations, and it should allow uh, people to take advantage of it uh, later this year. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you found the discussion useful.